Hit it. Let's get into it. One, two, three. And welcome to my whiskey den, and may the fourth be with you. It is a little Star Wars holiday, and I'm having something that I think you could find in a Star Wars movie if you were at a bar. This is a pretty <laughs> tasty dram. Um, we're lucky enough to have Colin Keegan with us tonight from Santa Fe Spirits in New Mexico. Evening. Evening. Um, Mike's with us from uh, Kansas City, and Ben may pop in. He may not. I heard he broke the, the staying at home rule again. And he might be in trouble. <laughs> but uh, it, it, like we were saying, thank you for being here, Colin. Uh, how has it been down in Santa Fe on your end with all with kind of being in the lockdown and everything like that? I don't. Are you guys in a lockdown down there? I never really looked that up. That's my yeah. Opinion. We are. We our governor's really closed us down. We're opening May fifteenth. Okay. Um, not much different from what I see on the news in every other state. You know. Um, New Mexico did has done has done the pardon me is doing fairly well. We don't have many deaths. Um, there's two million people in a state half the size of Texas, so social distancing is comes naturally. <laughs> I was going to say it's already there. <laughs> it's there, you know. It's, it's, that's called day to day living for us. It's not like the big towns, you know. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh. Well, it's uh, kind of the first question we usually ask people who are on the stream, um, going back in time in your life, what was kind of the first spirit, could have been whiskey, vodka, rum, could have just been a beer, that got you excited about kind of, sounds bad, but being excited about liquor in general and kind of mm -hmm. leading you down the path, but th there's no good way to get there. <laughs> um, Peterson. You know, I, I, it wasn't whiskey, actually. You know, as a younger guy, I guess my palate was different. I remember Southern Comfort, which is going to make everybody cringe. It's so sweet and sugary. When I, I tried one recently and it poured it out. But, um, you know, I, in England, back when I was a youngster, which is where I grew up in Eng northern England, beer was everything. And if you did a chaser, a whiskey chaser, it typically was a doer's or a, a blend of some sort, uh, you know, a famous grouse, something like that. And I didn't get this whiskey thing. That's not that interesting. And then eventually, when I found what my, my dad's liquor cabinet, which is different to mine, I thought, <laughs> oh, no, that's what whiskey's all about. So that was my conversion, was stealing bottles of whiskey from my dad to go back to college, you know, when we get home for Christmas. Like a lot of kids, really, I think. I was going to say, I'm like, there's a lot of us that were, I kind of liked that, where I was like, oh, we're drinking this, and all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I see why this is in the locked cabinet now. Like, yeah. It's distinctly why, bitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was very similar to a lot of kids. Um, I actually appreciated whiskey a lot more when I came over to the States. Back when I was an architect, um, a couple of clients gave me a really nice bottle as a thank you for designing the house. That was what I did before the whiskey thing. Um, we call it the whiskey nonsense these days. When we started, it was whiskey, but now it's whiskey nonsense, you know. Um, <laughs> but no, that's always a good thing to get from people. I used to have that uh, where, where I worked. Um, we did like lighting for a lot of houses or businesses and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we'll come in and you know, if you're there for a couple hours, once you get to about hour three and trying to pick stuff out, people start getting fidgety yes. or a little annoyed. And I was yeah. like, you know, we we can have a drink, you know, and I have, you know, these seven whiskeys. You can take a pick or, or and we have one bottle of rum and we can mix them. Yeah. You, you didn't have anything while you were at the store. Just remember that. But yes. if you want a little something to take the edge off of how much you just spent, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go. Uh, before we get too far, we usually like to steal a couple things from the chat, and I don't like to get too far away from it because I'll forget something. It'll spin by. So give me a second here. Uh, Spencer was wondering, where in northern England did you, where did you grow up? Uh, it was Newcastle upon Tyne, for anybody who knows England. Newcastle is the easy phrase if you're from England. It's the northeast, about um, 120 miles south of Edinburgh, mm. on, on the east coast there. Um, you know where that is. I, I have yeah. a friend living over over there, and well, oh, cool. husband was from there. 
and I'm well. There's a lot of places I'm supposed to travel. This thing kind of held me back, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we were joking that there's going to be a, a whiskey wor uh, whiskey den world tour when this gets done because we have too many places we're supposed <laughs> to go visit now. Yeah, <laughs> kind of got, got put in hold. But no, that that's awesome. I'm, it's, how did you end up coming from over there to over here? Was it just the architecture? Architecture? Um, it yeah, it was really. I left. Uh, you know. Bummed around, well, bummed around. I was a junior architect down in southern England for a while. Um, when the economy takes a downturn, nobody needs fancy architects to design the houses for them. I was in mostly residential. So uh, I lost a job. I thought, that's it. I went to see, hang out with my brother in the British Virgin Islands, oh, trying to be a beach bum, delivering boats and decking boats and scraping barnacles off. It was a lot of fun. Unfortunately for me, I got a job again as an architect. <laughs> I, mean, I applied for a job, and goddamn it, I got it. So the beach bomb thing, I failed at, um, and really failed at being a beach bomb because in a, within a year of landing in the Caribbean, I ended up married with a adopted daughter who was one years old, New York clients, and a Caribbean work crew. So New York clients think you could build a house in eight months, and Caribbean work crew say. Hey man, that's three years. And I was a 27 year old trying to pull these two things together, married with a one year old. I failed at being a beach bum. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have any time. I'm like, just the, just the having the, the one year old at that point sucks up a lot of it when you're trying to do work in general, let alone, like you yeah. said, trying to compromise people's ideas of what reality is. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, long road to home, but you know, still with the same wife, and my daughter's now 29. And I uh, moved to Santa Fe in 1992, set nice. up a shop, and, um, you know, started the distillery in 2000, actually, uh, 2010. Okay. So that's so 10, 10 years old. That's very cool. Um, and what, what made you want to start Santa Fe, Santa Fe Spirits? <laughs> um, another downturn in the architecture. <laughs> 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 well, it was, you know, um, you know, 2008 and then nine, nobody needed the high end residential house on a golf course, which was really what we, we'd been sort of slotted into. We just were doing a lot of big houses for rich people to be facetious about it, but they kept paying the bills. Yep, um, we're in a lucky position that found a building, bought a still. And then about a year later, went, holy cow, what have I just done? Um, <laughs> started making single malt, which wasn't very good. So that's why we don't have any 10-year-olds out. Um, ended up branching into all kinds of other things. But the real spark of it was, you know what? I, I want to just do something different from architecture. Um, we did get caught up in the... Oh, big is better, big is better, which is one of the reasons I think the whole economy tanked back then. Yeah. You know, too much, too much of everything. And um, this is a choice to be a bit more authentic, actually make something and go to work and get my hands dirty, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I, I love that because that's, that's kind of exactly what you said, especially when that happened. It was, I, I called it like a couple of years early. I'm like, well, these people are building you know, a $400,000 house and I know them. They they make what I make. They they should not be buying a four hundred thousand dollar house. I don't know how they're getting the loans for it, but you know, good luck. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so but, when when you started out, with, was single malt your first target, or were you looking for something else first? Um, I'll be honest. Actually, I can't. The signal's not going to be strong enough if I walked you out. If you walk outside my door, out there, you, I don't know if you can see an apple orchard out that way. Mm -hmm. um, I designed to build a house in an apple orchard. The project fell apart. I ended up buying the apple orchard from the client. Mm -hmm. My wife and I built a house here. We made apple brandy. That was the first target. Okay. As um, it really wasn't a business plan, to be honest. <laughs> it's a real idealist. Ta -da! And um, we dove into it, started making apple brandy. And somebody said, Well, you know, what's your business plan? So I tried to put one together and realized. Not enough people drink apple brandy. In Wisconsin, they drink lots of brandy, but not uh, apple brandy. <laughs> we, we're, we're big enough into that. We'll drink whatever brandy's up there. I, I think, yeah, we, eat, there I think we eat up two-thirds of the U.S. market. You I do. Said. You eat a ton of brandy up there. All in old fashions and things like that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, 
so we started making apple brandy. My goal was to put it actually sort of in the get what was going to be the guest house next door. Um, regulations being what they were, you had to build in a light industrial zone. And I'm pretty linear, so I followed the path of where all the government regulations took me. So we have a distillery that's built out by the airport because that's where you have the industrial area. Okay. And um, the business plan, you know, to once you start putting together a distillery, there's no regulation that says you have to spend a lot of money, but to fit the regulations and distances and OSHA's regulations and all the rest of it, you get bigger and bigger and we needed more products. That's when I said, you know what? Single mold would be cool. But we do have, like a lot of craft distilleries, the whole portfolio. We've got a vodka, which we don't make. We actually just buy NGS and process it. The apple brandy we make from apples, and now it's only 10% from my orchard. Um, Is that because it grew so much with that? The apple brandy yeah. grew. We go to Southern Colorado, and if anybody knows Hotchkiss and Peonia, some great apple farming out there yeah. and every th every second third year we get skunked basically um we end up with a, a a warm march or warm march in april and cold may you get a frost and it kills the blossom so you don't get a crop so anyway so one thing led to another we got apple brandy going and a vodka um really vodka was just gravy let you know to keep the lights on so to speak um our gin is actually still our biggest seller. We put all the botanicals in from New Mexico. So it's got Osha root, grows up in the mountains. We've got the cactus blossom we put in there. That um, does sound pretty unique compared to everyone else's. Yeah. That's awesome. There's only five botanicals and we actually harvest them all. Well, we have harvested them. Let's say they're sourced locally. Sometimes you have to buy them from other people. Um, there's Choya cactus blossom. And for the beer drinkers, our um, citrusy note, because New Mexico gets frost, so we can't have real citrus, is Cascade Hops, which if you know from drinking IPAs, has that sort of lemony flavor. Mm -hmm. That's the top note. And then very little juniper, but the big note is sage. Very desert-like, like the sort of sage brush you get in the desert. So it's different. We're, we're just working our way into gin. I was going to say, mm -hmm. and Mike and I were... I think earlier on, even now, not not as big into it, and we're slowly getting getting, to yeah, yeah, taste of it. And it, a couple of the things I've had recently aren't like the gin I had that my mom and dad had. Yes. That like, yeah, like legit pine saw, and you're like, oh, yeah. you can take uh, yes. your drink yeah. back. I I don't want to drink it, even even if you're trying <laughs> yeah. to give me it, you can just have this. Like, yeah, it tastes I, I like it tastes like your great aunt's perfume smells. Yeah, I was just gonna say, great <laughs> our perfume, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're, yeah, we're we have, we, yeah, we have gin, vodka, apple brandy. We do an unaged whiskey. I should have put it on the table here. A silver coyote. Yeah, it's oh. a white dog, but here in New Mexico, we thought silver coyote is as close to white dog as we can get, so we called it that. Nice. Um, and then the the three mainstays really are the ones that are gonna hold us through. It, we think are the whiskeys. It's all based around, I'll, I'll show you here. Mm -hmm. Called Keegan Single Malt. Oh, I'm pouring that right now. See? Oh, you got it right there, yeah. I do. Oh, <laughs> this this yeah. bottle is, is at the point where it's, it's oh, going down. Oh, man, we're going to have to refresh the bottle. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There's another one in the cabinet. <laughs> no, good, good. That's good. So that's, um, that's now been selling since 20, what is it now, 2015. Okay. We started selling that, so it's a five-year. Well, the, it's a minimum three-year-old whiskey now. Okay. Um, if you got an older batch, ten and before, it was two and a half year old. But okay. we're making two and a half times what we sell, so we are building an inventory, hopefully to keep growing the numbers. And it's getting older and older as we go, which is really helping its complexity and depth. I would think so. And you guys were, I know you were using. It was it 25 and 53 gallon barrels to age it? Yeah. Was it just 25 or 25 earlier and more like 53 now, or is it just like a combination of like depth and flavor between the two? No, we, we always did 53 from the beginning. The 25s were what we were aging the apple brandy in. Okay. Just for a year. So then we, here's, here's item number two. Uh, <laughs> it's like a, like a quiz show. Um, <laughs> this is Colkegan with an extra year of aging in apple brandy casks. 
So everything's in 453s, and then we empty straight into the apple brandy casks, the 25 gallon ones. Nice. That's the only size we do of 25. Okay. Um, we are going to convert back to 53s because now we've been around long enough that we've got enough inventory that we can bring the apple brandy out as an older apple brandy. Um, it's just, it's it's better. The, the wood's not quite as in your face. Yeah. You know, that oak. I mean, the apple brandy casks are first use, but only with a year of apple brandy aging. Okay. So there's still quite an oakiness to it. The, the, this one here, the apple brandy cask finish, the apple brandy is a little sweeter, leaning towards bourbon because of corn, and it's got a, a sort of newer oak flavor. So okay. this one is, it, it's not close to bourbon, it's all 100% malted barley, but a three-year-old called Keegan with an extra fourth year in oak. So there's more oak on it, so it does taste a bit more bourbon-y. But I mean, that's... Yeah, we were talking about how, that, how the extra little depth of flavor you could be pulling from the apple brandy, and, and it sounds like the wood could really kind of kind of twist the Cole Keegan, not in a bad way, but just, you know, maybe add three, four extra flavors to it that can yeah. really kind of kick it in a different direction. So. It does. It's um, it's fast becoming a favorite in uh, you know, the places it's carried because um, it, it's got a, a bit, well, it's got, a, it's a four-year-old whiskey to start with instead of a three and also mm -hmm. um that extra sort of difference in wood and an apple brandy we call it the way we do it we term it a, a wet empty we, we empty the apple brandy out turn mm -hmm. back put the whiskey in within minutes so okay. there's still quite a lot of apple brandy in there it's not like it's been shipped to somewhere and dried out and it's just the residue yeah, there, is apple brandy, there is an apple brandy note to it definitely that's good because I was gonna say there's a lot of places that might let that kind of dry out for like a week or yeah. two, and then kind of go back in, and you'd be getting a much heavier kind of oak note from that. Then, so that's yeah, that's really cool that you're doing. Plus, the second cask we were talking to someone else that just softens up that even if it's only been a year and something else, it kind of softens up how heavy that oak can be in it. No, it does. It really does. It's well, here in New Mexico, because we get so little humidity, that sort of came about as an accident. If we leave it for a week. We pour anything in it, it'll just fall out the bottom. We have to steam our casks before we put anything in them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that is, that's the problem of being in a desert, I would assume. It really is, which is a, a negative, really, but a positive is as we age, our proof goes up, not down. Wow. And we, most of the times, yeah. from just about everything we've had, we've liked, we like stuff at a little higher proof. So we're, yeah. we're behind you in that. I think there was only one that we found was like, it was 55 out of the cask, and then they lowered it to 47, and we were all like, the 47 is better. Like, I don't, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the 47 is better. Very, yeah. very, very hard to believe. And, uh, oh, yeah, Nathan's trying one of the samples I sent him, and he's wondering, I says he's a little love struck all of a sudden from trying to sample tonight. He's wondering if you have any, any distribution in Texas. Uh, Texas. Ah, Texas. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's that's a challenge we live next door we are in west texas which people laugh at me with lubbock middle of odessa amarillo and if you live up on that side of the state you're great um we are struggling to get into texas um it is if you live in texas it's the specs are in dc southern um lockdown as we call it and that's not by any Malicious means it's just, you know, prove, that you've got mass, prove you've got massive numbers in Texas before we let you into Texas. It's a chicken and egg, so we, we just can't break that at the moment. Yeah, We're still small. And they're very, they're getting to be kind of tight on the their distilleries in the last couple of years. Yes, where they are. And they've got some great ones. They really have got some great distilleries there. So but, like, um, we'd love to join them. Yeah, well, I... I think that there'll be a couple couple bottles moving around, like we said. There's plenty of people down there that I know that have, have tried it and have a few in their cabinet as well, too. Yes, because yeah. it is pre it is extremely tasty. Oh, thank you. So, uh, and talking about the the ages of your whiskeys, you it it seems at least from what I've read about your your warehouse, uh, it's it's extremely climate controlled. At least it seems to be more so than than almost any other place I've ever read about. Um, was that original designed or is that something that you just realized you had to do? 
Yeah, we realized we, well, I say we had to. We were desperately trying to keep a hold of it before it all evaporated. Um, now, we may change that um, and do a lot less control, but we heat and humidify the whole warehouse all year. About once a month, we'll crash it, as we call it. Um, you know, turn it all off and let the, whatever the weather is do what it does. You know, hot and heat, hot and dry in the summer, or sort of cold and dry in the winter. Um, now, th these are layman's terms. We don't have exact empirical data, but we reckon we lose twelve percent a year. That's just what I was going to ask you because I was yeah. like, there's some other places that once you get to like five or seven. Like the distiller's like, I'm, my job's in jeopardy. So I was wondering what it would be like <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> in, in, um, in the actual desert where you're, where you're dealing with that. So I, that's why I kind of figured that was kind of, you know, being put into effect. Cause I'm like, if you can try to limit that and even save, you know, 2%, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, with it being like I mean, that. I mean, we're, we're not massive, you know, we're, we're making about 200 casks a year, 200, 253 gallons a year which is, you know, decent enough. But um, when you think of a 12% loss compounded, um, yeah. it, it mounts up. So we've lost a third of it by the time we put it in a bottle. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm like, by the time you get three years in, it's you're yeah. getting some iffiness. So, yeah. So we're, we're looking at a real um, next warehouse. <laughs> Talking a building at, at these times is quite scary, but um, a real dunnage. You know, like a dirt floor, yeah. proper brick okay. house. Pull, put a CMU block wall up because it, it's stored in a, a tin, a tin steel building. Mm -hmm. But we have a we have a wall within a wall. We got a room within that, so we don't get a condensation problem in the winter and stuff. But um, if we could afford a real CMU block wall, insulate the shit out of the roof, and put dunnage on the floor, we we think we could do a lot better. Let's put oh, it that way. That's cool. I, there was with something like that. I know there was one other place um, that was trying to uh, kind of dig down deep or find a cave to, yeah. to age in as well, too, where yeah. it's like, well, it's a little more climate controlled in here where we don't have to be worried about it. But that sounds yeah. like an excellent idea to try to cut down on that. That's that's great. So do you yeah. do you use the, the, the climate controls that you do have? Do you use that to kind of have a little fun with the uh, with the weather inside the warehouse, too, and do things that. <laughs> that you couldn't do normally? You know, we do have a couple of guys that age their cigars and use whiskey bottles <laughs> in, our, in our warehouse. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we, we, we knock the, the, the head off one that we can just wedge back in. And with the whiskey <laughs> and the humidity that we pump in there, we leave the bung, the bung off because there's enough humidity rolling around. And they say there was the cigar. I can't do cigars anymore. I'm too, way too old for that nonsense. But um, he... Uh, he says it does really well for cigars. Um, we, we do try. We haven't really. I mean, with 10 years, we've really had the same warehouses. We built them in 2014. We haven't had that long to really see what an extra year or two here does. Yeah. It's just it is the formula we've got. At the but yeah, we're starting to play with. As I say, we crash it every month to see if it does anything interesting. Oh, that's that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. Kind of switching you back over because I know yeah. uh, the uniqueness from from this one is because you use mesquite wood to to smoke some of the malt. I think like at least thirty percent of it. Um, what led you to, to to use mesquite wood over some of the other woods that you might use to to smoke the malt? Well, what we found as we were going through putting together the distillery, which I just wanted to make whiskey was, you know, marketing's really part of your story. You've got to keep it authentic either to, hey, we're the best brand in the world, which costs a bit of money, or we're authentic to where we're from. So we decided on pinyon wood. There's two. There's really two woods here in New Mexico. We call them trees, but in other states they count as bushes because they don't grow above 30 feet tall. <laughs> pinyon and juniper, and juniper is the mesquite, is part of the mesquite family. Um, if you come out to the southwest and you get that really nice pungent slightly acrid um smell from the smoke that's pinon it's great and we tried age smoking with pinon or having somebody smoke for us and it came out with a sort of tarry acrid smell and taste that we didn't like um now that 
as having said that, that was just on the gray. We really didn't go through the whole process of it. But we we came across, you know, Juniper, realized it was part of the Mesquite family, tried smoking it ourselves, and thought, yeah, this smells like barbecue. You know, I mean, it, it, there's sort of that Mesquite wood flavor. Um, and then we lucked out by finding a guy in um, Virginia. Have you had um, Copper Fox whiskey? He does a single malt too. Yeah. Rick Wassman. Um, I, I haven't. Mike has had it. It's so. uh, Copper Fox. What's, I forgot the name of the distillery. Copper Fox is the whiskey line, I think. Anyway, he was another distiller and he was smoking the grain for us in a real Rick house. Yeah, it, it's a great story. He had his mom raking it on the floor. He's <laughs> my age. I mean, so he would have been in his 40s then when he started. <laughs> and his mom would have been in her 70s, you know, raking. And it's a great picture. He's got a house <laughs> and curlers raking the floor. Poor mom's I, retirement plan is out here, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Come I'm on, just, mom. Just I'm picturing, a, picturing yeah. a Monty Python skit. Yeah, it would have been, been a great Monty Python skit. Come on, hey, man. Come on, <laughs> The way. Come on. <laughs> so he was uh having he, 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 Rick's a good guy and he makes a great whiskey too. And as we started adding, we were doing a uh, one super sack about a thousand pounds a month. But as we started getting to you know five, six thousand pounds a month on top of his own whiskey production, he said, No, go somewhere else. So uh we moved over to the bigger houses that do it. We we get a, a smoked and an unsmoked that goes in there. Mm -hmm. And I think that the flavor when you get it is like it's so unique. It does pull you to like. I just, I know you. It, this isn't the type of whiskey you drink if you were in the old west at that time. Yes. But it, gi it gives you the mental feel for it. Like I'm yeah. like you, you have it, and you're all of them like. I feel like I should be watching Tombstone or so, you know, <laughs> you know, like I should be, you know, I'm, I should be watching something else. Like this really is, it puts you at home and gives you the right mindset yeah. to what you're doing. So that's what I dig about it. it, it that, that the mesquite would really kind of pulls your, your demographic and your area to, to like a certain area and really makes it kind of stand out for, for that section. So I, yeah, I yeah, dig it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. We, uh, we call it a lot of times in a lot of our marketing pitch is uh, campfire whiskey. Yeah. You feel like if you're going camping, take a bottle of Carl Keegan with you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think when I first had it compared to like other stuff, I, I like told someone, I'm like, this is like American smoke to me. Like this is where yes. you're getting, you're getting smoke and other stuff from, from a lot of scotches in there. But I'm yeah. like, this is something you could label as like clearly being like an American smoke. It's very unique. It's, it's very regional. Um, and it had a really awesome punch to it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just, we, 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 we enjoy this. I mean, we only a third of the grain is smoked actually. Mm -hmm. one, one third of it is done by Brees Malting House for us in Chilton there, back from Wisconsin. You know them? Yeah. They, and, uh, they do a lot of stuff, but there's not too many people that do a lot of, of barley and malt and stuff. So no, yeah, they, they smoke that barley and, uh, Shakopee, Minnesota does the other two thirds of it. Okay. We, we tried a full hundred percent smoke and wow, it was back in the Ardberg Lagerbullen category. You know, it was a bit too much for us. <laughs> so we went, we went back to something that we can sell to most Americans. We hope. Tell this just on that whole art bag log of one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you have any casks with that stuff in it by chance? <laughs> that was, you know, we don't, we okay, would love, I mean, we, we're not quite, um, in, into the larger category. I know some of my uh, buddies with other distilleries um, are trying to talk to the Scottish guys. Can we get one of your casks to finish ours in? And we can have one of ours to finish yours in. Um, the Balconis guys from Texas are doing stuff like that. And they're, they're trying a project where they're aging Balconis in Scotland and have some Scottish whiskeys aged in Texas. Which is kind of fun, and I, I believe the guys at Westland are starting to play with that. Now, if you're really getting that darker, richer kind of smoke note, we do know a bunch of people that would be would, would also yeah. delve into that world as well yeah. too. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, I I I like me an odd bag at the end of a long weekend, you know, <laughs> uh, sat late deep into a Saturday night when it's late, you know. I actually I was lucky. I was at a trade show. And I traded a bottle of Cole Keegan for Octomore. I can't normally afford that, but Holy that's shit. great stuff. That's what it's three hundred parts per million or 
Yeah, but that that's all. Even to find it around here is a pain in the ass. So that's yes. awesome. <laughs> It like, didn't oh, last long oh. enough, but I'll, I'll wait for another great show. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's great. That, that's an awesome trade. That's going to be a good part of like going to trade shows is being able to to do that and to kind of meet and kind of do some nice networking like yeah. that. That's that's yeah. great. That's um, one of the reasons we try and drive as much as we can because you can end up with an extra couple of cases of your stuff and come back <laughs> with an extra couple of cases of other people's. It's great. <laughs> um. How with the whole kind of virus thing going on? How I know your distillery started making hand sanitizer. Yes. How, how has that worked out for you? Or are you getting to put anything into actual barrels right now, or is it all pretty much hand sanitizer production? Because we've had some people kind of be all over the board with that. Um, in April, we didn't make anything. Okay. Um, any whiskey? I mean, we made. We were processing about five hundred gallons of hand sanitizer a week. So that, that's that's two totes, you know, that, that's a lot of hand sanitizer. Um, my distiller was pulling his hair and he wanted to give out to whiskey. What he's done is he's um, basically filled one of our fermenters as a big batch of sanitizer. And because we can't have other people in the building, we normally bottle with volunteers. We're still one of those little distilleries that has a lot of fun. That's a cool. That's a cool week to come out or a day to come out. It's a cool day, which we can't do at the moment. So the staff are all... My sales guy's out running out curbside delivery of sanitizer and then going on the bottling line. So we pulled him back into the distillery, our distiller. Um, our assistant distiller just moved right before all the COVID stuff happened. So we, we just run a crew of two in there. Okay. Um, so our distiller is back by himself and, um, you know, really getting his hands dirty and having a good old time in there. So yeah, yeah. I would hope, hope in May, he'll get at least, you know, maybe 20 barrels put down. That'd be kind of fun for him. Well, that's good, just switch over. But I, like I said, we know a lot of people here have been, when they switched over, it's like, it's just easier to keep going in this route and knock out a, bu yeah. a bunch of it at a time instead of cleaning everything out and switching it back over and, and yeah. kind of reevaluating it. Well, ours is, uh, so, some guys are trying uh, what I think is a very heavy lift of uh, distilling beer into NGS. Our, our still is only a five plate, so we couldn't do okay. um, a, a vodka or an NGS out of it. So we just buy NGS in. We're lucky to, that our supplier is still supplying us. We, we found that. Plastic bottles are a problem, but we're now trying to separate back into whiskey for the future and hand sanitizer for the very short term, mm -hmm. you know, until purell decides hey we want the market back again and then comes back in and shuts us all down from sanitizer <laughs> sorry that's pretty funny yeah, yeah. Uh, spencer's asking anything without the smoked uh barley or smoked malt in any of the are there well basically you make anything without the mesquite wood kind of smoke to it um is there anything in any barrels like that where it's just kind of the the normal malt yeah, you know, when you sent some questions of, you know, what, what we're going to be talking about, you asked what's coming in the future. Mm -hmm. We have a small run, only six casks of unsmoked Kalkingen, made basically just the same way. So it's going to be a plain, straight, single hull. Okay. Um, it's tasting okay, but it's only had 18 months. Okay. Um, I, so I'm not going to put too much emphasis on that, but we're trying an unsmoked uh Carl keegan so we're going to make it the same way what we do have in the market at the moment is a white dog which is silver coyote okay never had smoke and it really wasn't designed that way so it's actually quite a decent spirit for, for white dogs i mean we call it monotone whiskey it's malted barley that's it there's no smoke there's no oak flavoring or anything like that hmm. um we keep it at 92 proof, the same as the Carl Keegan. Okay. 100% um, malted barley, so it's got a sweeter note to it. And it's not like some white dogs, it doesn't rip your face off. Like some of them try to, you know. Um, it, even at 92, it's, it's, it's soft and approachable. It really is quite a decent spirit. It makes a great, we call them whisker readers instead of margaritas, because we're out here in the Southwest, whisker yeah. readers. Um, and that is unsmoked. So what we did was, the silver coyote, it was designed to be a white dog. So we don't take our Colkegan 
and then just put some into bottles and some into barrels because Carl Keegan has a much deeper hearts cut. You know, mm. we go well, well, well into the tails because of the great flavors that are there that mellow out as you age. Silver Coyote is only a straight 50% of what comes off the still. Okay. So it's quite a pure spirit. We're not messing with it. We're no, you know, instead of a 10% heads cut, we go well into 12, 13, and the tails cut doesn't get anywhere near it. So it's a good Silver Coyote. It's, it's worth Googling and looking at. Oh, that, that sounds actually pretty interesting, especially like you said, because there are a lot of uh, moonshines that, that do, like you said, rip your face off. Or, yeah. <laughs> or, I, or, I, or you have the drink of it and it goes down and you're like, oh, I'm fine. And then all of a sudden, like, you, you feel the heat build back up, flowing yeah. back through your head. And you're like, your your face starts turning a different color. And you're like, whoa, yeah. I, I didn't know. I, mm. I guess that's it's good for part of what I wanted to do today. Not not for the enjoyment <laughs> factor. I'm, I'm much more relaxed. Yeah. I'm ready to have a good time. But Yes, yeah, there you go. <laughs> So do you have a, with your, the spirits that you're making and, and in particular, the, the single malt, do you have a cocktail that you like to, that you like to make with them or you think is ideal for your spirit? You know, the, this is going to sound like a marketing pitch because we just, because of the pandemic, fine. we, uh, we started bottling cocktails. Okay. okay. This one's called, they, they named it after me. It's called the nut job. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, this is. Two parts Colkegan whiskey. It's very like a, an old fashioned, really. Okay. Two parts Colkegan whiskey. One part our whiskey liqueur, Adapino. Okay. I'll talk about that one in a second. Yeah. Um, one, sorry, uh, yeah, two parts whiskey, one part Adapino, one part vermouth, dash of orange bitters, and a dash of walnut bitters. Oh, and, I like the two um, uses of the different bitters. That's cool. Yeah, the the bitters, the orange and the walnut really pull out. Just a bartender just was playing around and came up with this. And right, that's it. That's my favorite cocktail ever. Um, so that's sort of a go-to for us. Definitely in the Manhattan old-fashioned style of cocktails, boozy whiskey type yeah. of drink, you know. And and we're I'm, I understand that we we love our old fashions here, but and I yeah. like the, and I'm a whiskey, so I actually would probably like that better than the brandy. But up right. here, you know, brandy is ridiculous. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you drink a lot of it. Yeah. We have to. Sp I have to specifically note that when I order an old fashioned, everyone's like, "Oh, old fashioned, sweet or sour or whatever." I'm like, an old fashioned whiskey, whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And actually, I'll take the bottle right there. You know, <laughs> and yeah, out. To, you have to point it out. Yeah. <laughs> For what it is yeah. uh that that's sweet I, I what was the other one you just put up um the other oh yeah um Adapino. now when i was talking about trying to keep things regional mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like i really love it because i talk like a silly englishman but i really love being in new mexico this liqueur here only comes in these three seven fives but it epitomizes um being here in new mexico Okay. It is um, our unaged whiskey, our Silver Coyote whiskey base that we infuse with roasted pinon, as they call them here, pine nuts. Oh. So we put a 25-gallon down, fill it with whiskey, put 25 pounds of roasted pine nuts in that barrel, leave it for six to nine months, depending on how where sort of where it is or how warm it is. And then we pull it out and we sweeten it with ponderosa pine sap and uh, a little bit of turbinado sugar. And you can see it's cloudy. I don't know if that shows there. Yeah. That's actually the ponderosa pine sap in solution. And when I was talking about camping, this one really feels like you're sort of living, eating, breathing, chewing, whatever the wood is around you when you're out in the woods. It really is a great liqueur. That and um, hmm. yeah. There's that sounds really unique. I yeah. guess, like you said, you were going for like a regional one, and I think that yeah. totally, totally follows suit. That is, so, this sounds really interesting. Yeah, Especially it's just using the sap. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry about no, that. No, no, sorry. I was going to say that the sap gives us a reason for all of us to go hiking. You know, um, I don't exactly give the staff time off to do this, but I say, <laughs> well, if you're hiking at the weekend, take a little jar. So they take a jar. And you scrape the sap off. You know when they get wounded or a branch breaks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the bleed sap. 
Well, a pondo is a pine sap is the stuff when you used to go on those field trips with the school teacher and they said, stick your nose in the tree and smell. That's that vanilla smell. Okay. It's got a strong vanilla flavor to it, which is kind of cool. That's very interesting because like yeah. pine, pine sap here, not nowhere near vanilla. It's just <laughs> more, more along that gin flavor line of yes. things. <laughs> turpentine. Yeah. Don't say turpentine. That's bad with liquor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, are there are there any other th things that you're like releases that you have out right now? Like, what's the what's the lineup that you have out there um, besides kind of what you had? Is there anything else, or is that kind of the main? Oh, I, we didn't talk about your cast strength. Oh yeah, the cast strength. Yeah, this is one. This is I I didn't realize. Gosh, you think in a pandemic, I, I plan a bit better. Um, this is one we made for a local um, liquor store because we do single cask releases as well for Zia Liquors. How I've got their sample bottle, I don't know. But anyway, I'll, I'll drink this one. Um, this is a cast strength version. So we keep this. This is at uh, 118. Nice. Uh, which is way up there, you know. 118 proof. Uh, 59. Um, the way we describe it really is when we're making Cole Keegan, you know, we want it, Cole Keegan, to slowly elevate over years. But really be the same product so we pull 15 casks at a time 15 okay. 50 50 gallon casks that's the size of the mixing tote we've got <laughs> yeah <laughs> needs a must so we pull 15 casks so we're looking for the the smokier note from here the oakier note from there wood's going to do what it does you know so they're all a little different some nuttier some more caramel and get the cole keegan balance mm-hmm when we're pulling through those casts, so we, we look at anything over three years old. So at the moment, we've got about a 180, 200 cask inventory to pull from. Nice. We'll go to those casks and pull them. And every so often, one yells, don't fucking mess with me. Leave me in my arm. <laughs> and that's where cask paint comes from. So every one of these is a little different, but has all the balance of Cole Keegan and something. It just, just says, don't, yes, I don't have too much oak, no, too much caramel. I've got a nice balance. So they, they do vary a little, but generally, that's the one to go for. And uh, But at 118 proof, it's, um, it'll blow your skirt up, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a lot of fun. Well, it, it, it kind of slaps you around the room a bit. <laughs> yeah, it slaps you around a little bit, but in a nice way, you know. Yeah. Just like well, a, that's you know, we, if we usually say we like to slap, you know, that's that's one of those ones yeah. you, you kind of enjoy. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those. Yeah. Oh, oh. Do you Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. That's a, back to Monty Python again. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you have you thought about exploring brandies anymore? Um, you know, it's interesting. We let's say we were thinking of um doing a pear brandy. Okay. Um, which would be kind of fun. I think one of the best drinks I've ever had, and I don't know if you guys have tried this, I'm sure you have, the Clear Creek Pear Brandy. No. Okay. By yeah. Steve McCarthy out of, um, um, what do you call it, Washington State there. He's a farmer. And that was one of the inspirations. Um, there was Clear Creek, Jermaine Robin. I'm sure you've heard of Jermaine Robin and their brandies. Yep. And a little bit of um, uh, what do they call it? Hangar One and the guys up there. Yeah. We, we um, tried some of their stuff at uh, Distill America, one of the uh, yeah whiskey shows here. That was that was the place that my wife found a vodka that she she referred to it because because of her grandma. She's like, this could turn me into Grandma on the Rocks because that, <laughs> that was that was that was her grandma's nickname was Grandma on the Rocks. She's like, they have a they have a citron vodka that. I don't yeah, know. It, it could do. be warm, and I can just drink it, and I don't care. Like this is this is going to go down. <laughs> yeah. That's that was what those guys did, but they were sort of inspirational. And the um, the uh, what do you call it? The pear brandy that Steve McCarthy did. It's now now owned by uh, Hood River, the guys okay. from Pendleton. Um, but keep, keep an eye out for it. Paul Paul William, and they do the the the, the pear in the bottle. That's just what Nathan Clark okay. asked if that's the one with the pear in the bottle. So yeah, yeah, that that's exactly it. We actually do an apple brandy. I I hang the trees in the orchard 
when I'm really motivated. I might get back to it this year, but every second or third year, I'll go hang the bottles in the trees um, and grow apples in bottles. Oh. And that, that's kind of a lot of fun. So that might come back into our realm. That's kind of um, crazy cool. Like It's cool. It really is. It, it The brandy's not as good, actually, but don't <laughs> tell anybody because we charge three times as much for a bottle. But um, well, it, it, it gets sweetened and the, the, eventually the apple, even in our high proof alcohol, breaks down a little bit. So you get particulates okay. in there. It's not bad, but it's very um, earthy, like the old scrumpy cider kind of thing, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's really where we're going. I mean, we're going to see how the un unsmoked whiskey goes, if that turns into something. Mm -hmm. um, we're celebrating 10 years since, well, since we got our license, not since we really get up. Um, yeah, somebody there is asking, do we have a 10 year anniversary? We're going to do a sherry cask finish. Son we got, uh, yeah, we got. <laughs> Sorry, but we're going to have to signal the Tourette's alarm. I was going oh, yeah. to go, go, go. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever was just asking the question was reading, really reading my mind. Um, this September, I'm having a big shindig at the distillery, and we'll have some bottles that, if direct to consumer shipping happens, we can ship around. Oh. Um, we've got two of the, what were they, 63 gallon. Oloroso casks that we had shipped over and um, <sighs> I'll be honest we did buy some Oloroso sherry and swill it back around in there just yep. to sort of wet wet it down again we let it in there so it could evaporate into the cask left it for a week made sure it was steamed and then we could put the whiskey in and oh god it's it's really good if you're around <laughs> in, if we can travel in September come up to Santa Fe we're having a hell of a party that's uh, that sounds neat, and, and especially the way you did it, where you kind of like re wetted the barrel bit, which is I totally love. So just kind of freshen it up about yeah. before you did it, because like we were, I think we were talking before, you can you can really lose a lot it, by the time a barrel gets over yeah. here from where it's where it's coming from. You'll still get the flavor, but it really does kind of brighten it up if you do something like that. So yeah, that yeah. sounds yeah. delicious. Yeah, that's and it sounds deadly too, like a little. So, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna keep it at higher proof. Yeah, as well. When in September is your anniversary party? <laughs> we haven't we haven't quite decided yet. We're, okay. we're sort of very, you know, like everybody, we're, we're sort of week by week at the moment. It's like, how do we keep the doors open, you know? Mm -hmm. when, when does the PPP loan run out? And when does my <laughs> line of credit run out, you know? But yeah, we're, we're probably looking at mid, late September. It's a gorgeous okay. time to be in New Mexico then. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. says like my like Mike's got the calendar out. He's like, what fucking day is it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know I'm I'm good for a long road trip. I'm yeah, you're welcome anytime. That, that actually the the Olorosa sherry. That's that's probably one of my. I, I that was where I kind of started leaning with a lot of kind of finished casts for a while. Recently, I kind of gotten a little bit more into port, but like I do love a good sherry finish. And that like same thing with the apple brandy. It just would be a really unique kind of extra kick to this. Yeah. Um, that I don't. Whew, that sounds wonderful. Um, <laughs> I have to get my brain out of brain out of the gutter. I'm thinking too much about it for a second there. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Sorry, well, pop that back on. Um. So what else can we talk about? There's loads of things to talk about. Oh, well, there is. As I say, we went over a couple of the other things on on there. Um, so as far as getting your product. Um, what online places can you mention or do you not mind mentioning where people can order your product? Um, well, in the sort of Western part of the U S we're with LibDib. Okay. Um, you know, so that's California. They're working into Colorado. We have a distributor in Colorado, but, yeah. um, you know, with the stresses and strains of what's going on at the moment, we're, we're hoping that relationship keeps going. They're very small. You know, there's like a, yeah. Uh, 20 person sales staff for the whole state um if that doesn't happen we would shift to live dib in colorado which means basically as long okay. as the liquor store asks for it and they've signed up with live dib we can send it um we are distributed in new york wisconsin idaho montana oregon new mexico western texas it's actually, 
So that's pretty decent. I yeah. was gonna say that's pretty decent for for the size yeah, that you guys are at. Scattered, yeah, uh, we were in Georgia, but because of NDC and our NDC, the, the NDC in New Mexico and, and Georgia, that didn't happen. We're trying to get back onto the uh, Cascas list. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and if you do the little sample kits of whiskeys, Flaviar carriers. Yeah. Oh, and that's um, awesome that you guys do you, you yeah. do the, the small ones, or is it like a set of three? Or yeah, it's it... a set of three. Actually, what Flaviar do is they bottle it themselves. So we ship them a, a tote, a 15 or 30 gallon tote, and they div- divvy it up into the little bottles. That is um, awesome because we were talking yeah. about how frequently that does not happen where you yeah. get to have a nice kind of core lineup of what's going on and yeah. have like the experience before you go you go grab a bottle and it is you know for like for you guys if you were doing it it's a hell of a lot more expensive to do the little bottles yeah. than it is the bigger ones so yeah ch- check out flavor that's that's a great way to get like a good kind of core sample of what's going on because um there's not enough places that do that. I mean, that's how I think I, I got started with Caval was they had a set of three and a little, you know, when I walked into yeah. the liquor store and I was like, oh, well, hell yeah, I'll take a couple 200 mill, you know, three to 200 milliliter bottles, pay the same as you do for one, whoop de doo Yeah. But you get to try it and it's not just, you know, a tiny little sample. It's enough to go back a few times and see what's going on. <laughs> no, it was definitely, yeah. I mean, we're with uh, Flavia. We joined the um, uh, Joe Beatrice's project, the Barrel Project, okay. and he does a blended malt. Well, a va- sorry, a vatted malt. Um, something that's very exciting, and I, maybe I'm speaking a little out of turn here, is a, a group called Lost Lantern that's coming out with a vatted malt, which okay. for those who don't know, it's a blend of single malts. So they're all a good high quality and we've teamed up with Westwood, Virginia Distilling, um, Triple Eight out of Massachusetts, Balcones, um, Copper Works, and then one other that I can't remember. <laughs> He's going to be mad at me. But anyway, <laughs> so um, I would, I mean, if you're really getting into something esoteric, if you've got the American single malt thing down, Start looking for some American vatted malts. Okay. And uh, Lost Lantern are doing a really bang up job of putting some stuff out there. That sounds. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be a cheap bottle. It, it's probably floating around 100, 120, but 120 mark. But I think it's worth it. No, well, and if you start looking at some better, when you compare it to like some better scotches, yeah. 120 dollars is not crazy to spend on it. Like no. we were talking art bag before, you're looking 70, 80 for yeah. you know a name on something. Um, so that sounds fantastic. And a lot of the places you named are places that are making some respectable stuff. And yeah. I think when Mike and I were talking about this with some other people is we were thinking, we were saying that like American single malt is kind of the new frontier that's kind of ready to explode. Like everyone, yeah. some people will say rye is, but like really rye is already hit and is, is yeah. huge to be honest. And like the new kind of emerging one we've been saying for probably um, you know, six, eight months, we're like, we really think that the American single malt is the next kind of big thing for people to dig into and be like, there's some quality stuff here. And you've been producing it for quite a while. So, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, believe it or not, um, actually, well, I'm one of the founding members of the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission. Okay. Which is going to be very exciting. There were six of us. And again, I can't, I've had a whiskey, so I can't remember any names. But, um, there's a guy called Steve Hawley. He's okay. with uh, Westland. Yep. In, uh, everybody knows Westland. They're great, great single malts. He's really heading up the charge, and he's putting together a board so that we can actually – our goal is to get Taxation Trade Bureau recognition. Really, it's a marketing pitch. Mm-hmm. That in liquor stores, you know, you see the little swinging signs hanging and pointing you down there. You know the the bourbon aisle or the rye aisle, and the, the, there's now categories for Japanese whiskey. There's not that many. There's even a Taiwanese whiskey aisle. You know, I mean, it's yeah. not an aisle; it's a section. But we want an American single malt arrow. There's 130 members, and they're all paid up members. So 
there's a lot of single malts coming down the pike and it's going to get really exciting i'm very excited yeah. to see what yeah comes and up. i think that so should be a wait. section that that should get that section in there yeah, yeah. i mean if you're saying, I mean, let's be honest, the most liquor stores, when you're giving a Japanese section, what's there going to be like 10 bottles? I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's 10 different ones. There's, yeah. there's not a lot. I mean, there's stuff that's there, but there's how much yeah. is really available to a lot of liquor stores is, is yeah. a whole different whole yeah. different thing like that. But no, yeah. that's actually really exciting to hear because I, that would be fantastic to kind of see that category like kind of get set in there and, and yeah. kind of move with that because we've been kind of moving down that path for a while and it, it's deserves the respect that that's with some of the stuff that's coming out yeah. is very potent and it's not the and i know you guys can do it with how long you guys have down there but like the 10 or 15 year old versions of stuff that you're getting in mm -hmm. scotland it's being produced in you know four five six years even yeah. sometimes two um and it is pretty pretty amazing what's getting done comparatively um, with that and oh they're having a discussion about how fry is a hipster whiskey in, in the chat, <laughs> um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deny that. I mean, man, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> well, no, it, it's interesting that you know it, it's funny. I'm in my mid 50s, so I, I laugh at the whole hipster term because they don't <laughs> like the term to be branded in any way, shape, or form. But um, the 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 fact that rye is on an upsurge, and like Irish whiskey is too, and on an mm -hmm. upsurge, and it's not just Jameson. We that was the joke for a while, but if there is some great, oh God, I love Irish whiskey when it's really want something really soft, but um, the, we, we believe the American single book is, is kind of going to tuck in and be the next great thing after that. What we're actually lobbying for is taxation and trade bureau category recognition. So we can put some parameters around it. Sort of like the bourbon guys did. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be as restrictive as that. We want to, you know, it's got to be one grain, one distillery. And we're, we're, we're allowing aging in different size casks. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're trying to be inclusive instead of the Scottish Whiskey Association, which is a bit exclusive, you know. <laughs> that's, that's my <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. A bit. It only takes you 15 <laughs> years to start a distillery yeah. there. Like just, yeah. yeah. And, and now they're changing their tune because they're realizing they're losing a share to the rest of the world for, for good reason, mm -hmm. you know. The, the, that they thought that threat was Japanese. I really think it could be the ingenuity of what's coming out of America. I really yeah. believe that. Yeah. I, I, really I, I agree. I, I totally agree with that. And that it, it's we. I mean, we've covered a lot of well, mostly small craft distillers. Yeah. And it it seems to be the most exciting, especially when you find somebody who's got you got a spirit. You taste it. And you're like, well, this is this is 19 months old. And you're like. Oh my God, this is yes. fantastic. And, yeah. and it's just because they've, they've chosen to, to, um, to one, not, not source their spirit, you know, yeah. to try something different because it's like, I, I have to make a, 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 a mark for myself. So here's yeah. what I'm going to try. And they're coming up with some fantastic stuff that, that the, the, the big producers would never make and probably yeah. could never make it. I don't, they, they could never, they could never make a spirit like you're doing because they don't have your mindset and, no, and they don't have their place. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, but yeah. I get more excited about finding something on a road trip or on a shelf. That's like, <laughs> I want to try that. That looks yeah. fantastic. And I, you know, I've heard about that and it gets, yeah. it gets me excited. And, and it gets you like a lot of times with, with the crab was on Mike saying it, it brings depth to the story, which a lot yeah. of times adds to the whiskey experience. Yeah. I've, yeah. Let me, I've already thought that like, adds a whole nother notch like this is fantastic and then whiskey nerd pat kicks in and he's like and did you know this and did you know that and we're, we kind of have to kind of peel back and be like i don't want to overwhelm these people but yes. do you know why this is so effing cool you know yeah. like there's there's not just is it do the taste great this is how they got from a to b in yeah. only two three years so no it is i mean there, there's so much creativity going on out there I think the American single malt category is really trying to, I mean, it, don't get me wrong, in all that creativity, there's, some, there's been some bad whiskey come out. <laughs> and I hate that all my buddies, the same as you can say, you know, my my buddy on my soccer team is not a good guy. He's not a good at soccer, but I love him dearly, you know. There's some bad whiskey <laughs> come out. But Sorry. You know, maybe I should stop drinking right now. But anyway, <laughs> no, but, I mean, the, 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 the reason for the category, the categorization, 
it's to try and sort of herd it in a little bit at least so somebody's not trying to say well i found some oak chips and i threw them in a stainless steel <laughs> tote and it's four days old you know yeah yeah um, well and i think that's something that, that's important to kind of like you said when you're making making a category happen is to get that and you do want it to be a little traditional but not overwhelming like you like you said but like when you're getting into the like you said throw whiskey chips in or or the yeah. the light method and stuff like no that's that's a whiskey it, and it it may still be good in its own right but that is not it hasn't yeah. taken the time it hasn't had the nuances kind of put into it over time and the effort put into it that a lot of the craft distillers are doing so i wouldn't want to see that kind of lumped in there like i said i'm not gonna yeah. say it's, it's not good i've had one or two things that were okay but they um they especially with like the light infused whiskey it, it seemed to over time lose its taste which sounded mm -hmm. weird but like right out of the bottle when i first had it it had more potency six months later after it got oxidized more all of a sudden it felt like it was losing its punch you know yeah. where, where with a lot of other whiskeys like all of a sudden you get a little oxidization after a couple months it starts to add a little complexity to it that might not have been there before and you don't want as a representation you don't want it to be going in the wrong way as time goes by <laughs> right no i'm there with you i mean i'm a i i like the inventiveness and the creativeness of the category but i i quite a traditionalist in that I believe you, you really just can't beat oxidation over time. Mm. You know, some wonderful things that go on in those casks that just, yeah, we can pontificate scientifically about all of them, but yeah, th there's a magic as well. Yeah. And Nathan, yeah. we're not doing that. Uh, Nathan's yeah. getting excited in the ch chat. He's saying, go on, name names. And we're like, no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're not going to have that way. Uh, and actually, we I, are. I sit on too many whiskey boards of various different sorts. You know, I don't want to go to my next ACSA board meeting and have somebody go, "You said okay, sorry." <laughs> that was towards the end of the interview. That wasn't right away. <laughs> but uh, and on that note, we are kind of hitting an hour, and we usually don't want to eat up too much of your time because we appreciate you coming Absolutely. out and, and being very giving of your time um oh, you know how busy it is and how everything's got everyone's got a family and got life going on um so we appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us uh, we well yeah likewise i love love what you guys do and i'll, I'll have to join in and listen to the next one yeah uh, and, and come back yeah, yeah. <laughs> come, and come hey if, if you're getting oh, some yeah. towards uh when you said in september if for some chance we we don't get to get out there um we maybe we could you could come on we could talk about the newer the share release at that time and let yeah. people know about it because that sounds super interesting yeah um, that, <laughs> <laughs> very interesting yeah see it is, it is. whiskey trips that that could be a whole nother side series yeah you know i i if we do start traveling again i could see a lot of you know i think the bourbon trail is a wonderful thing to do and it was a lot of fun but i could see some real long road trips around there's 2,000 craft distilleries. You really don't have to travel much more than you know half a day to get to the next one. Well, that that was kind of what our what our other shows on was having people like you on is to kind of get get the word out there about what's going on if you are going on vacation. Because that that's yeah. what I always I always did was like if I'm going on vacation, I'm not just going to a city. I'm going to a show. I'm going to see something yeah. unique. And now it's kind of it's more distilleries for me but at one point that was kind of like a really sweet side trip was like well we have a show we're going to it at you know seven o'clock tonight what are we going to do from noon until whatever let's go check out this distillery and see what happens now that's more on the schedule beforehand not just what <laughs> gee where could we go that, that's, <laughs> that's kind of the point of the trip sometimes uh, and, and and the show was extra but like yeah it, it is it makes like a whole experience of seeing a town or an area you get like kind of that extra depth to it that you don't always get like it might have been a restaurant before that you went to that was like well this was super cool because we went here and it was really authentic i find yeah. distilleries to be very authentic and very regional and very kind of open and honest with who they are so yeah. it, it really adds to what's going on um yeah i i love it. one of the things you know when you really get tired of the whole Having to sell whiskey is hard. Having to make whiskey is a lot of fun. Um, hanging out with all my buddies. And Colorado is, what has it got, 104 distilleries now? Yeah, it's huge. Really cool. I, I mean, there's 12 of us in New Mexico. We all hang out a lot. But I just love going to see other people. It's a great team. 
technically we're competitors, but we never think of it that way ever. We're um, all in it, all in it together, pebbles in a bucket. Well, and that's the way a, a couple of the other craft distillers we talked to were like, "Well, we're not really, we're not really against each other." It no. sounds bad. We're against the big boys, and if we could, if we can eat up five, ten percent of their sales, we'll we'll take it. You know? Yeah. Well, we will <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'll take some leftover yeah. what's there. Um, but thanks to everyone in the chat for stopping out. We appreciate yeah. it. Uh, thanks for coming out and hanging out with us. If you get a chance, uh, Whiskey Crusaders is on after this. I they've been interviewing one or two people recently. I don't know if they're doing that tonight, but stop and check them out. But Colin, thank you so much for coming on. We yes. really appreciate it. We look forward to talking to you again in the future because uh, everything you shared was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And never be afraid to email me, Colin at SantaFaceBirds.com with one L. And I'd love to talk whiskey with anybody and everybody. Okay. Then one last question. Yes. And totally just because the, when I saw first saw your name and then I saw the name Cole Keegan, you, you clearly kind of named it after yourself. Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we mentioned the Scottish Whiskey Association. This this was called because I wanted it to be like a single malt, and I thought, what single malt? Yes, yeah, Scotland. And that was when I yeah, back in thirteen and fourteen when we were trying to name it. It was called Glen Egan, oh, meaning okay. you know you know because I have water that runs through the property here, which irrigates the orchard, you know. And it's a little stream, and it, I thought it's a bit like a Glen, Glen Keegan. And <laughs> they, they I, don't got like quoted, that. <laughs> I got quoted in a local <laughs> newspaper saying, Glen Keegan's coming. You wouldn't believe it, but some Scottish guy, I think his name was like Magnus Magnuson or something like that. It was a very Scottish <laughs> name from the Scottish Whiskey Association, said cease and desist. They pulled my trademark. So, so, so did someone else have it? Had a trademark being... for Glen Keegan. They pulled it. <laughs> and we were having the labels printed and we wanted to get it in and we were having a release so we said quick do something i said well they can't take my name away so i this is what i sound like when i'm drunk okay good <laughs> colin keegan is my name yeah there you go <laughs> well i just assumed that but i'm like i, I, like, I kind of dug it because i'm like it doesn't sound like a name when you hit it it just it sounds it, it sounds very cool so yeah i i, I assume yeah. that was what happened with <laughs> that's the genius of my wife she goes put your name on it they can't take it away from you then <laughs> that's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> All right, but you guys have a good night, everyone in the chat. Thanks for stopping in. We'll see you guys later. All right, thanks, Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Let's get into it. One, two, three.